Hey guys, it's your family here, and today I'm going to be reading another chapter of Sunset of Kind. I swear, I need to rec I need to read this book like more regularly because now it's I'm doing it like once every like three or four months, and it's not it's not good. I need to be able to make this. I want to make this like every week or so, like once a week, uh, every week or something something like that. Uh, but we're today we're going to be reading chapter eleven, decisions, decisions. So let's get started. The small alarm clock on the nightstand beside Kristen's bed woke her up with a start. She reached out into the darkness and fumbled around for several ringing moments before her fingers closed around the clock and she managed to silence it. Too early, the botanist thought to herself lethargically. It took her a moment to realize where she was, and when the information floated up to her consciousness, she groaned aloud. Due to the conversation of the night before, Kristen had not slept well, but she wanted to get up and use the co-ed showers before either of the men awoke. Before Barrett's shocking revelation, the shared restroom was the only thing about coming to the Institute that had bothered her. However, if she got showered and dressed before either of the guys awake, she felt that she could get used to an earlier wake-up. She turned on a lamp, slipped out of her nightgown, and put on a thin, pale yellow cotton robe. Tying the belt as she slid her feet into a pair of matching slippers, Kristen looked into a large mirror and almost chuckled at the reflection of her hair fluffed all around her head like the mane of a male lion. She opened the top drawer of her dresser and pulled out her shower kit. From the small bag, she plucked out a brush and began grooming her fur. Grooming my fur? She blinked in amusement. Did I really just think that? She laughed aloud and felt good for doing it. The previous day had been a strange day at the Institute, so she hoped the second would be better. Mercy had told them that today they would have their physical examinations, so perhaps that would give them something else to occupy their minds. Although she hoped she would see no one else on her way to the shower, she felt more presentable with her hair brushed into a better semblance of order. Giving herself a brief smile in the mirror, she picked up the shower kit and turned to leave the room. The smile disappeared instantly when she remembered the large chair she had scooted up against the door in lieu of not having a lock during the night. She sighed in frustration and wondered if she would have to do this every night. She rolled up the sleeves of her robe and then put her back into moving the seat aside so she could get out. The chair was made of a solid material and was heavy, but she managed to slide it out of the way to its original place beside one of the nightstands. There was no one in the saloon area, which was still dark except for a couple dim orange nightlights along the walls. The skylight overhead showed no glow of the morning sun, so it was too early for even old Saul to be awake. With her shower kit in hand, Kristen padded across the carpet towards the linen closet. She selected a soft towel and washcloth, and then headed to the restroom. Just as she reached the door, Jenny came out, nearly running into her in the darkness of the saloon. Oh, Kristen exclaimed, startled. Good morning, Jenny. Hi, Kristen, Jenny replied, running a comb through her wet hair. Without preamble, she leaned in close to the dark-haired woman's ear and said in a low voice, Watch yourself in there, she warned. Kristen's eyes narrowed. Is it Brian? she asked. Jenny shook her head. No one else is in there now, she replied. But earlier while I was in the shower, Dante slid the shower curtain aside and took a picture. He was gone by the time I finished and got dressed. Probably in his room doing unspeakable things while looking at your picture, Kristen remarked with a scowl. Jenny's expression was one of amusement, and that puzzled her. Did you scream at him? The botanist asked. I didn't scream, Jenny replied with a chuckle. He did surprise me, but I don't mind that he saw me. You don't mind? Kristen repeated. No, so long as they don't touch, I don't mind if guys see me. I just warned you because I thought it might upset you. Thanks, it would. What are you anyway, an exhibitionist? Kristen asked before thinking. Jenny laughed. Not consciously, she answered. But I grew up in an open-minded family that sometimes spent its summers on clothing-optional beaches. Kristen drew back in wide-eyed surprise. You are a nudist? She gasped. I could never do that. Jenny shrugged, something that Kristen could barely see in the light coming from the open restroom door. I've been doing it since I was a kid, so it feels natural to me, she admitted. I know it's not something everyone's comfortable with, but you should try it sometime. It's such a sense of freedom. Kristen hung her head down and nodded at her lower lip. Not for someone who looks like me, she mumbled, suddenly very conscious of her weight. That's for people who are confident about how they look. Jenny put a hand on the other woman's shoulder. That's not true, she said quietly. People of all shapes, sizes, colors, and backgrounds can be found at clothing optional beaches. They're just regular people, and because everyone is in most ages of undress, no one really cares what anyone else looks like. Once you get used to it, it feels natural. 
Kristen shook her head. We aren't at a nudist camp, she countered, so I have no intention of bearing myself to anyone but my reflection in a mirror, and not even that if I can help it. Jenny smiled in the darkness. That's okay, you don't have to, she answered. There's no one else in the restroom right now, so if you need to go, now's your chance. Thanks, I will. Without another comment, Jenny patted her on the shoulder and then disappeared into the darkness. Kristen sighed quietly and then went in through the door. Only one of the ceiling lights was switched on, so she didn't have to worry about her eyes adjusting to the brightness. She walked to the shower furthest from the door and slid aside the vinyl curtain. There was plenty of room inside the cubicle, with a wooden seat across the back corner and a similar shelf higher up across another corner. She opened her bag, pulled out fully laden shampoo and conditioner bottles, a container of scented soap, and a razor. She set the bag on the bench seat in the middle of the restroom and then looked around briefly to make sure no one else was around. She pushed off the slippers with her toes under the bench and then slid out of her undergarments, stuffing them into a pocket of her robe. She stepped back into the shower stall, removed the robe, and then hung both it and the towel on the hook just outside the curtain. When the warm spray came out of the shower head, she was pleased to discover steady water pressure and soon was lost in thought as she cleaned up and shaved her legs. By the time she had finished, she was smiling and ready to face the day. However, when she extended a hand out of the curtain to retrieve her towel, she heard a noise that made her freeze. Water was running elsewhere in the restroom. Jenny had already showered, so she hoped it was Mercy. Kristen quietly pulled the towel inside the stall and quickly dried off, keeping an eye on the curtain. When she had dried sufficiently, she wrapped her towel around her hair and then retrieved her robe from the outside hook. She heard someone shuffle, so she picked up her conditioner bottle and held it over her head in readiness. Just as quietly as she could, she pulled the curtain back, but there was no one there with a camera in her face. The sound of water came from her right, so she eased around the corner and saw what she dreaded, a bare-chested male form wearing only athletic shorts. A small groan escaped her throat and the man began to turn in her direction at the sound. The feeling of terror washed over her so quickly that she had flung the weighty conditioner bottle before she'd even realized that it had left her hand. Despite that it was a mere gut reaction, her aim was true in the dim light. The flat bottom end of the plastic bottle hit the man in the temple and the force of the blow knocked him against the sink. His fingers were wet with hand soap and he lost his grip on the counter, dropping to his knees. A mumbled curse escaped his lips as soon as the man's dazed brain could function again, and when he looked at the short woman standing near the showers, his eyes were wide in bewilderment. I know you hate me for who I am, Barrett managed to say, but a sneak attack wasn't very sporting. Kristen opened and closed her mouth rapidly, and then put her hand up to her chest to hold the robe close. I'm so sorry, she exclaimed. I thought it was Dante. Barrett scowled back at her and reached up to grab a handful of his rust-colored hair. Does this look like Dante's head to you? He complained loudly. I'm sorry, Brian, she replied. I really am. She wanted to run over and make sure he was okay, but her state of undress kept her rooted to the spot. Barrett grumbled something beneath his breath and then struggled to get back up to his feet. He was still somewhat dazed from the impact of the large economy-sized bottle that had struck him. What, what are you doing in here? Kristen asked with a gulp. The broad-shouldered man put his hands under the running water in the sink for a moment to wash off the soap. When he had rubbed them clean, he let his palms fill up before splashing the cool water on his face. He reached over the hand towel nearby on the counter, and it was not until after he had patted his face dry that he finally looked back over at her. I always start and end my day exercising, he explained in a calmer voice. I had adjusted one of the exercise machines and got grease on my fingers, so I came in here to wash it off. Oh, the woman replied. Do you want to explain why you thought I was Dante and hit me with this brick? Barrett asked, bending over to pick up the bottle of conditioner. Not wanting to approach her, he merely set it on the counter. I ran into Jenny on the way here, Kristen replied in a small voice. She said that Dante had taken a picture of her while she was in the shower and wanted to warn me in case he did the same to me. Barrett felt the bruised temple gingerly and blinked several times. Somehow I can't say I'm surprised that he would do that, he remarked. Didn't you hear me in the shower? She asked. Yes, and you have a lovely singing voice, Barrett answered. I wasn't going to bother you. All I needed to do was wash off my hands, but since our sole restroom was closer than the kitchen, I didn't think anything of it. Kristen approached him tentatively, still clutching her robe close with one hand. With the other, she reached out towards his temple. I'm really sorry I hit you, she apologized again. Does it hurt? The man raised an eyebrow at her, but even that action was tender. Enough to put me on my guard every time I'm in here from now on, he replied in a lighter tone. Her fingers gently brushed his hair back into place as she gave him a wan smile. I don't really hate you, she said quietly. I don't approve of what you did, 
but I think I can understand you a little. You made a mistake and will now be paying the price for the rest of your life. You don't need me beating you up too. Barrett looked down at her and chuckled in spite of himself. I've heard the small ones put up the biggest fights, he said. Now I have first-hand experience. A bit of color crept into Kristen's cheeks, but Barrett didn't give her much time to be further embarrassed. I didn't finish my usual exercise routine, but I think I'm done for now. I'm hot and sweaty and am in need of my shower. I'm going back to my room to get my soap and razor, so that should give you enough time to get dressed where you won't have to worry about me watching. Thank you, the woman said quietly, suddenly unable to meet his eyes. May I use your shampoo and conditioner? Baird asked before he turned to go. My lawyer provided me with a few clothes when I was taken from the prison, but I didn't get anything like shower supplies beyond a bar of soap when I left. Sure, if you don't mind smelling like wild strawberries. I'll leave them in here on the counter for you. I appreciate it. Without waiting for further conversation, he slipped past her and then out the door. By the time Barrett had showered, shaved, and dressed, the saloon was illuminated in the soft glow of the morning sun through the skylights overhead. The rich aroma of coffee filled the air, and all three of his roommates were sitting at the round table at the center of the pit. Although Kristen had showed him a small amount of kindness concerning his situation earlier, he did not expect that from the others, so he left his room dressed in jeans, boots, and a white t-shirt and walked over to the kitchen without acknowledging any of them. He found fresh coffee on the warmer and a clean cup in the cabinet, so he helped himself to the aromatic brew and flavored it with a spoonful of sugar. He also found a bowl of fresh fruit that had not been there the night before, so he snagged a banana on the way out the door and then headed to the exit to take in some morning air. Feeling stuck up now that you've had some sleep? Dante called across the room. Barrett stopped in front of the video screen and turned to look back at the other man. Stuck up? He repeated incredulously. I figured you'd have a better start to your day if you didn't have to bother with me first thing in the morning. Oh, come over here and join us, big guy, Dante replied. Really? Barrett remarked with a raised eyebrow. Yeah, really? The red-haired man shook his head in genuine surprise and took his breakfast down into the pit. He sat in the remaining chair between Dante and Kristen and then took a quiet sip from his cup. Dante scratched his pencil-thin mustache and gave the older man a crooked smile. He was wearing the same pants from the night before but clad in a fresh blue shirt. When Barrett looked across the table at Jenny, she gave him an uneasy smile and then brushed imaginary crumbs from her lavender blouse, but at least Kristen's expression was openly friendly. A little color flushed her cheeks at the memory of what she had done to him earlier. She was dressed in a pale yellow blouse and matching set of slacks. I hear you've had an exciting morning already, Dante remarked with a grin, glancing briefly at Kristen. I think we all have, Barrett responded in amusement, pulling on one of his sleeves of his t-shirt. It felt like it was a size smaller than he normally wear, and it was fitting like a second skin. What do you mean? Jenny asked quietly. From what I heard, he caught you in the shower with his camera, and then Kristen clocked me in the head with a bottle while I was washing my hands, thinking it was him in there to do the same to her. Dante looked surprised, but Jenny suddenly chuckled while Kristen took a quick sip from her own cup of coffee, averting her eyes. Dante looked surprised, but Jenny suddenly chuckled while Kristen took a quick sip from her own cup of coffee, averting her eyes. You know about that? Dante croaked. In reply, Barrett simply asked, How'd the picture come out? Well, to tell the truth, the battery in my prepaid comm ran out on the bus yesterday, and I don't have a charger. I only pretended to take a picture of her to see what she would do. Sneak! Jenny replied. You just wanted to see me naked in the shower. Well, yeah, Dante admitted with a sly grin. Who wouldn't? Listen, you, the blonde woman said, pointing a finger at him. With a shared bathroom, I know you're going to see me occasionally, but you'd better keep those long fingers of yours to yourself. Don't even try to sneak a peek at me, Kristen warned him. You'll get what he got this morning. She looked over at Barrett and gave him another embarrassed smile. Dante held up his hands in mock surrender. Okay, okay, I'll behave myself. He said with little conviction, though it was clear no one believed him. He cocked an eyebrow at Kristen and pursed his lips. You hit him in the head with a bottle? He asked. A full bottle of conditioner, economy size, Ju uh, Barrett replied, tapping his temple where it had struck him. Ouch. What was everyone doing up so early this morning anyway? Kristen asked, peering into the depths of her coffee. I just wanted to take a shower before everyone else was up and about, but it looks like I was the last one awake. I couldn't get comfortable, Dante answered. New place, new bed, and all that, you know. Due to the hospital shifts I usually pull, I've always been an early riser, Jenny replied. My body hasn't adjusted to my new schedule yet. What about you, Dante asked the older man. Why were you up before the sun came up? Plotting your escape? Barrett peeled his banana quietly. Instead of answering the question, he looked askance at the other man. I appreciate you inviting me in to sit in with you, he said in a calm voice. 
But after last night, I'm surprised you're letting me near you. We talked about it while you were in the shower, Dante admitted. None of us were really comfortable last night knowing there was a killer in the house, so I intended to go see the director first thing this morning to see about getting you moved out. What changed your mind? Barrett asked just before biting into his breakfast. He pointedly did not look at any of them, simply sitting there with his ears on the conversation. Jenny reminded us that you're the one who is here to stay. If any of us wish to leave, we can. But you can't, Dante informed him. Yes, I suppose that's true, Barrett replied after swallowing. He'd said as much to them last night. He peeled the banana a little bit more, but still did not meet anyone's eyes. None of us want to leave, Kristen added, so we all decided to try and make this work. Barrett looked over at her. Really? Yeah, really, Dante confirmed. Barrett turned his attention to the blonde nurse who had not spoken since the conversation had turned serious. You're going to give me a chance, he asked her. Her powder blue eyes met his for only a moment before she looked away. We don't have much choice, she said quietly. You said that you would give us the same promise you gave to Marcelo if we gave you a chance in return. Did you mean what you said? Look at me, Barrett said. All of you. When each of them returned his gaze, one at a time, he nodded. I have nothing left but what's ahead of me, and there's nothing you can say or do that will ever equal what Parker did to me. All I ask is that you give me the opportunity to be just another volunteer going through the program just as you are. What about your attitude against furs? Jenny asked soberly. What of it? You know where I stand and how I believe, Barrett replied in an even tone. I think I made that perfectly clear last night. You may hear me grumble about it from time to time, but no one at this institute is in danger from me because of it. You still think that you're going to be mindless when this is all over? Dante asked. More than ever. What happens when you get to the end and you're still you? If that were to be the case, then I would be extremely pleased to have been proven wrong, Barrett replied truthfully. It would be more than I could hope for. However, I seriously doubt it will turn out that way. Brian, Kristen asked tentatively, may I ask you a personal question? The broad-shouldered man tugged at another tight sleeve. What is it? Why do you have such a dim view on life? She asked. You have killed, were caught and sentenced to die, but yet you are given another chance at life. Shouldn't you be happy that you're still here? Even here? Without pausing to consider his response, Barrett picked up the coffee and replied, I'll get back to you on that after we've started the process. The dark-haired woman shook her head. When we first met yesterday, you told me that you wanted to be my friend since I would be the transterrestrial botanist in the colony who would determine if the local plant life was poisonous or edible. I was being flippant, but I also felt it was a good idea to start making friends, especially those who might have a direct impact on my life. Fair enough, but even since we found out who you are, you seem to be trying to avoid forming any further relationships. Is that such a good idea? Kristen asked. The three of you looked like you were going to lynch me last night, Barrett replied dryly. Relationships between a lynch mob and the condemned don't usually last long. I think Brian's just trying to get the jump on us and start thinking like a feline, Dante quipped with a grin. What do you mean by that? Jenny asked. Barrett looked over at him with a raised eyebrow. Dante chuckled and said, Cats, like we should all become, do not tend to form lifelong relationships. They might congregate around others, but they're extremely independent and are often aloof. I've already adopted some feline attributes myself. Thankfully, moving the conversation away from Barrett's situation, Jenny gave Dante a mischievous look. And what attributes have you adopted? She asked. Dante smiled widely. Cats aren't necessarily governed by the same mating rituals that humans follow, he said with a mock whisper. The males can and will mate indiscriminately with any willing female. He punctuated his remark by waggling his eyebrows at both Jenny and Kristen, adding a leering grim for emphasis. Jenny merely looked back at him, certain that he was nothing more than a lot of hot wind. But Kristen shuddered and shrunk into her seat, crossing her arms across her chest. She had read stories about men with attitudes such as what Dante professed, and was concerned he might try and force himself upon her some night. Of course, she had no real evidence that she could voice on this, but he made her feel dirty any time he leered at her. She had not felt comfortable around him since their first meeting the night before. Barrett merely shook his head in amusement at Dante's verbal deliance. You all know that I'm destined to take the form of a mountain lion, Barrett said, breaking the mood. But none of you have mentioned what you have chosen for yourselves. Anxious to change the topic again, Kristen sat up straight in her seat, but Dante jumped into the conversation ahead of her. I want to be one of the great cats, the dark-haired man responded quickly. Possibly a tiger or a lion, but I haven't made up my mind. Barrett looked over at him. I thought you had to make the choice before you even signed up he remarked. Jenny shook her head. You only need to let them know which of the four races you want to be, she explained. Felis, Canis, Ursus, or Vulps. 
On the table was the folder that Mercy had left for them. Jenny tapped its corner. Since we're all in the Fela swing, we all have obviously chosen feline, but we still have to choose between the cats that are available to us. What if you wanted to bring your own animal DNA? Dante asked. Like that of your favorite house cat? Not allowed, Jenny replied. That was covered in the material you were given to read. It's because the materials they use here have been thoroughly checked out against disease or abnormalities. So what do you think you will choose? He asked her in interest. The blonde nurse opened the folder and flipped through the pages idly. Spotted leopard, she announced after a moment, stopping at a related photograph. I've always thought they were beautiful creatures. I also considered the snow leopard, but I think the standard leopard will camouflage better in wild terrains. Barrett asked Kristen, looking over her in simple curiosity. Well, she replied hesitantly, since I'm not very tall, I thought I'd go with a smaller feline, something like a lynx, bobcat, or ocelot, if they're available. I haven't decided yet. There was a lynx in the cafeteria, Dante reminded her. Oh, I hadn't noticed, Kristen replied. That's because you are too busy ogling the males, Barrett teased. I was not, she replied defensively, but her reply was diluted when she exchanged guilty looks with Jenny. Dante pulled the folder towards him and began flipping through the samples. Each page contained an image of each of the felines available, with another photo alongside of past volunteers who had made the transition to show a sample of what the result might look like. All three of his housemates looked on curiously as he turned the pages, but finally he stopped at one and stared at it for a long moment. Bengal tiger, a white one, Dante announced with a finger on the photograph before him. That's it. That's what I want to be when I grow up. Well... Jenny said with a mischievous glint in her eyes. If you don't make it in the colony, you can always join an act in Las Vegas. The dark-haired man grinned and then raised both of his hands in the air, fingers curled like claws. Roar, I say, roar! Kristen pulled the folder over to her side of the round table and took a quiet sip of her coffee while browsing the pages. I'm still undecided, she murmured. Just a reminder of what the doc said last night, Barrett said aloud. The process is irreversible. Once it started, none of you will ever be human again, so you'll have to be sure before you take that injection of modified DNA. That's true, Kristen remarked, still looking through the photographs, but I still have a couple days before I have to make up my mind. After several minutes, she pushed away the folder and then peered into her coffee cup. I need a refill, she said, standing up. Anyone else? I've had enough, Dante replied. I get too jittery if I have too much caffeine at one sitting. No thanks, I'm still nursing this one, Jenny said. She stretched languidly, fully aware Dante's eyes were on her form as she did so. Barrett stood up and looked over at Kristen. I could use a refill, but I need to doctor it up. He gestured towards the kitchen and then followed the shorter woman out of the pit. As they walked, Kristen looked aside at him. Brian? She started. When he returned her gaze, she closed her mouth and looked down at her feet. Yes? It was not until they had crossed the room and entered the kitchen before she looked up at him. Bear gave her the time she needed, so he took the cup from her hand and placed it beside his on the counter. He picked up the coffee pot, refilled both cups, and then returned the near-empty glass container to its warmer. Did you want to ask me something? He queried, searching for a spoon on the counter beside the sugar bowl. He dipped a spoonful of sugar into the cup and then began stirring it lightly. You said that you'd be getting a new identity soon, she said quietly, taking her cup to the refrigerator to add a splash of milk. That's right. For volunteers, it's an option, but for criminal sentencing, it's mandatory. Barrett replied with a nod. I believe the anonymity is to protect me from further retaliation from the victim's family and friends. Of course, that's the standard rule for someone sentenced to become a fur. Neither Rebecca nor hers or Parker's families know I'm still alive, so if by some chance I ever do meet up with any of them again in my altered form, the new identity will protect me. Do you know what your new name will be? Kristen asked, leaning back up against the counter opposite of him. Not yet, Barrett replied. I assume I was supposed to get the new identity given to me before I got here, but I made the decision to accept this fate only the day before my execution, and I was whisked away too quickly to get the information set up first. Will you keep your first name, or will they change it all? If they do it like the witness relocation program, I assume everything will change. First name, last name, background, information, education, and all that. I'll probably have to memorize my new personal history in case I get into a conversation with anyone and they ask me about my childhood or something similar. I'm surprised they allow you to tell us about it, Kristen mused. I thought the purpose of a new identity was to hide you from anyone who knew you before the old one. Barrett shrugged. I don't suppose it matters at this point, he responded. Whether my name is Brian or Mephivosheth, I'm never going to be allowed to rejoin human society, so whatever they call me will only have an impact on those I'll be living with from now on. Kristen studied the interior of her coffee cup so that she would not have to look at him. 
I hope you don't think me petty, she said quietly, but I hope they do change your first name. Barrett looked at her with a raised eyebrow that she did not see. Any specific reason? Yes, the botanist replied with a voice barely above a whisper. Brian was the name of my ex, and he was one of the reasons why I'm here. Ex-husband? Ex-boyfriend, Kristen clarified still studying the swirls of milk in her untouched coffee. Barrett did not respond right away. Do you need to talk about it? He asked quietly. No, but thanks for asking, Kristen answered, looking at him with moist eyes. Like you, I have people to leave behind. My life as a fur is the best promise I have for a new beginning. If it will help, you can always call me Dell until my new name is ready. Dell? Kristen grabbed the nearby paper napkin and dabbed at her eyes. My middle name is Delano, he replied with a casual smile. Your folks didn't like you very much, did they? Dante asked from the doorway. Kristen jerked her head up and Barrett suddenly looked annoyed. Standing behind the other man was Jenny, who looked embarrassed at having been caught eavesdropping. How much did you hear? Kristen demanded. Dante shrugged his shoulders. Everything after Delano here poured coffee into your cups, he admitted. I'm surprised you didn't hear us walking across the room behind you. The floor is carpeted, Kristen reminded him. Dante only smiled back at her, but before she could say anything more, he looked at Brian and asked, Mephibosheth? He was a fugitive from King David in Old Testament biblical times, Barrett explained. I just pulled his name out of memory to make a point. That's not a name I would have just pulled out of the air, Dante remarked. Kristen set her coffee down on the counter and crossed her arms. Now that you know why both Brian and myself are here, she said grumpily, why did you two join the program? New worlds are opening up for settlement and only furs are allowed to attain the new lands, Dante answered in sudden animation. Volunteers are rewarded a payment of one million dollars after serving five years starting up a new colony. The money is to be awarded at the end of that time, and then those veterans are given the option to study at the colony they help start, or emigrate to one of the other fur colonies of their choice. Kristen shook her head and muttered something about his greed, but then looked past him at Jenny. What about you? She asked. You're so beautiful, why would you want to trade that for a permanent fur coat? Jenny smiled at the compliment. I've always gotten along with animals, but I also like the great outdoors, she replied. The colony will always need doctors and nurses, but I'm also a survivalist and a naturalist, and the chance to explore a new world was just as inviting as the bonus. A naturalist? Barrett asked. Jenny spread open the top of her blouse so that they could see that she had no tan lines beneath her bra straps. I'm outdoors a lot, as you can see. Without asking permission, Dante leaned in close and peered into her blouse top, pulling the bra strap a little further out with his finger. When Jenny did nothing but smile back at him, he brazenly gazed down into her cleavage. Did you say you were a naturalist or a naturist? He asked in awe. What's the difference? Kristen asked, holding her arms close across her own chest. Dante laughed again, stepping back from the blonde nurse. A naturalist is outdoors a lot, he told her. A naturist is a nudist. Already knowing that Jenny had spent her youth in clothing optional beaches, Kristen just rolled her eyes at Dante's exclamation. Barrett simply shook his head and watched the interplay quietly. Jenny chuckled and grinned at them all. You can say I'm a bit of both. Dante looked surprised at her revelation, but then he leaned in close and wiggled his eyebrows at her. I'll have to watch you more closely. Here, I have something for you, she told the dark-haired man. She stepped back and then pulled both arms through the sleeves of her blouse until they were fully inside the garment. She wriggled around for a moment and then triumphantly pushed her arms back out through the sleeves. In one hand, she yelled out her bra and then tossed it at Dante. Without missing a beat, the young man snared the undergarment from the air and then tucked it inside his shirt with a smirk. Dante. Come on, Dante. You're better than that. He's not really better than that. <laughs> Uh, that's it for that chapter. I'll see you in chapter 12 in about three and a half years. My god, I was recording for three hours. I am so bad. I was like, when I first started this, I was like, man, this is going to be a fast chapter. It's going to be a short chapter. And so I was like looking at the scroll thing and I was like, man, there's, it seems really short. Three hours later, that was not a short chapter. <laughs> Or maybe I'm just really I'm I'm just really bad at reading because it doesn't seem that long, but it took me three hours. I'm really out of practice though. I'll see you in chapter twelve though. She opened the bag and pulled out a full. Mm -hmm. When the warm spray came out of the shower head, she was pleased to discover steady water pressure, and soon was lost in thought as she cleaned up and shaved her legs. I don't know why she's cleaning or shaving her legs. She's just gonna grow a bunch more for her in a minute. 
Her fingers gently brushed his hair back into place, and she gave him a, wa a wan smile. One. I gotta Google that. I'm hot and sweaty, and I need my shower. I'm hot and sweaty, and in, I'm hot and sweaty, and in, and am need, and 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 am in need. I'm hot and sweaty, and in, and in and am in need, and am in need. And am, and am in need, and am in need. I'm hot and sweaty, and in am need, and am in 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 need. God dang it! I thought that this was a short chapter. It's like. A little color flushed her cheeks at the memory of what she had done to him earlier. Ladies. <laughs> Take it out of context. <coughs> Don't put that on a compilation, okay? Bunch of weirdos. Oh, I can see the end. Oh, it's only been two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs>